All right, the last section that we're going to touch on for this chapter would be this, uh, the evidence for evolution. Starting with fossil evidence. Fossils are the remains and traces of past life or any direct evidence to a past life, such as trails, uh, footprints, preserved droppings, things like that. Fossils record the history of life from the past. They document a succession of life forms from the simple to the more complex. Sometimes the fossil record is complete enough to show the descent from an ancestor, um, but not always. Um, when this is the case, we have what are known as transitional fossils. They are a common ancestor for two different groups of organisms, and they allow us to trace that descent of those individual organisms. So here's just sort of an example of a transitional fossil. In 2004, a team of paleontologists, um, those are scientists that study fossils, discovered fossilized remains of a tickalique, a uh, tickalique rose. Um, this is going to be sort of like a fishapod. They named, well, they nicknamed the fishapod because it appears to be a transitional form between a fish and a four-legged animal, or the tetrapods. The, the fossils are estimated to be around 375 million years old and are from a time when transition from fish to tetrapods is likely to have occurred. It has a mixture of fish-like and tetrapod-like qualities. Um, for example, it's fish-like in that it has gills and fins, but the pectoral front fins appear to be the beginnings of wrist bones. So unlike a fish, it appears to have had a flat head with eyes on top. So it has a little bit of both. Um, there's also biogeographical evidence. Biogeography is the study of the range and distribution of plants and animals throughout the world. Um, biogeographical distributions are consistent with the hypothesis that related forms of life evolved in one locale and then spread to accessible regions. There's a different mix of plants and animals so that would be expected wherever geography separates continents, islands, seas, etc. Um, marsupials, mammals which, in which females have an external body pouch where the young complete their development, evolved from egg-laying mammal ancestors. Today, they are endemic to South America and Australia. Uh, when Australia separated and drifted away from other land masses, the marsupials diversified into many different forms. Here's an example of some of those different marsupials. Uh, the sugar glider is a tree dweller. It's kind of like a, a flying squirrel, but it is a, it's actually a marsupial. Uh, the Australian wombat is a mars marsupial, same with the kangaroo. There's also going to be anatomical evidence. Um, for example, the vertebrate forelimbs are a great example of homologous structures, meaning that they all contain the same set of organized bones, uh, of bones organized in sort of the similar way, yet they are modified extensively to meet the various adaptive needs. Darwin interpreted this as support for a hypothesis of common descent. So homologous structures are anatomically similar because they are inherited from a common ancestor, but they're functionally, functionally very different. Analogous structures, on the other hand, serve the same function, but they are an anatomically very similar, or anatomically very different. So they're not constructed similarly. So thus, they probably do not share a common ancestor. Homologous structures probably um, started off with a common ancestor and then uh, diversified branching out throughout the generations based on what that particular environment needed. Analogous structures are more like the organisms may be on opposite sides of the planet, so they probably don't have a common ancestor, but they live in very, very similar environments. And so they're going to have very similar features and characteristics, not because of common ancestry, but because of commonalities um, in their environment. And then finally, there are vestigial structures. Vestigial structures are fully developed anatomical structures in one group of organisms that have become reduced or obsolete with functions in similar groups. So here's an example of homologous structures. Um, so for example, between the bird, the bat, the whale, the cat, the horse, the human, we have the similar groupings of bones, humerus, ulna, radius, metacarpals, and phalanges. However, if you look at the difference, the difference between a human humerus and a horse humerus and a whale humerus, huge difference. They all serve kind of the same function, but they're, they're, but they're hugely different in structure. Um, hugely different even in function. Birds use theirs to flap their wings. We use ours for general mobility. Whales hardly use theirs at all. I mean, they do use them for, for movement of the entire large fin, um, but they're not going to have nearly the flexibility or extensibility that a human horse or a bird humerus would have. Um, so I'll let you spend some time with this. It's all kind of self-explanatory, so I'm not going to go into great detail, but spend a little bit of time looking over this um, diagram.
There are also going to be developmental similarities. Um, embryological development looks much the same um, for all vertebrate embryos. Um, they're all going to have a post-anal tail and paired pharyngeal throat pouches that are going to be supported by cartilaginous arches. So whether we are looking at a human, a chicken, a tortoise, salamander, or a fish, the initial embryological state, uh, stages are going to be very, very similar in shape and structure. Um, Finally, there's going to be a biochemical evidence for uh, evolution. And this is because all living organisms use the same basic biochemical molecules. Um, we utilize the same DNA triplet code. We utilize the same 20 amino acids within our proteins. This is so hugely important. This is why we can start, um, when we're testing new pharmaceuticals, we can start off by testing on bacterial cultures. Bacteria are prokaryotes. Um, but but all living things sort of have a lot of the same biochemical or a lot of the same biochemistry. So we can start testing our pharmaceuticals or not even pharmaceuticals, but we can even test um, do behavioral uh, behavioral analysis. We can test um, all sorts of drugs and medications on a variety of animals because our biochemistry is going to have so much similarity across the different species. Um, there are DNA base sequence differences, so when they're similar, it suggests common, uh, recent common descent. When they're more different, it suggests more ancient common descent. So based on similarities in um, cytochrome C, cytochrome C is just one protein. It plays an important role in the electron transport chain within the mitochondria of all cells. So whether you're a yeast cell or a human cell, um, we're all going to use some variation of pro cytochrome C within our um, the electron transport chain of our mitochondria. However, um, the actual shape and structure of cytochrome C varies quite a bit from species to species. They're going to be most similar between humans and monkeys, um, with pigs falling not terribly far behind. But as we get um, further, as we branch further and further away, we can see greater and greater differences in the amino acid sequence for cytochrome C. And that's it for this chapter. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns.